Welcome to Making Conversations Count, where we are sharing honest and relatable conversations with business leaders and that one conversation that counted for them. We are so pleased to be in the top rankings for indie podcasts and especially in marketing because we love to bring you business leaders that talk about sales, marketing, networking, business, social selling, and a wide variety of other topics too. Now, today we're going to be talking with a leadership expert about inclusion. What's new, Wendy Wu? Well, Wendy Wu is going to be out of office for a couple of days, working with a team of five internal and external salespeople who are just looking for a refresh. And the world has been a crazy place for us to be able to pick up the phone and reach people. So I will be going in and helping them to reset for the world that we live in today in how to start making those new conversations count. I'll keep you posted and hopefully I'll be hearing that they will be counting the benefits in their commission packs as they put things into practice. Now, each and every one of us is a little bit unique. That is what makes this planet such a special place. Now, today's guest leans into his point of difference. And in actual fact, it comes down to his name because it's a name that when you read it, You can't say it phonetically. You need to learn how to say it. And my first attempt is a devil's in the detail thing for me when you're picking up the phone and you're introducing yourself to somebody and you're asking to speak to them by name. You really want to be getting it right because it's a great first impression. So I was so pleased when Chopay said that he would love to come and chat with me about what he does in his day-to-day role, breaking down barriers and bias against taking certain actions. It's a really nice chat around being intentional and the goals that we want to achieve, not only in our career, but also as a family. And that conversation that counted? Well, I like his wife already, but you better listen on to find out all about it. Today, we're going to be making conversations about inclusion count. And I've got a very, very interesting character with me. And I'm only going to attempt his first name because I'm bound to get the last name wrong. (laughs) So I have Chopin with me making conversations about inclusion count today. And I'm going to have a stab at it. So don't hate me if I get this wrong. Agbalusi? That was beautiful. Uh, You know, it was not just a stab. You got it spot on. Well, Wendy, see? You knew what you were doing. You knew what you were doing. (laughs) I want a blue Peter badge now. (laughs) (laughs) Me. Mm. With with a name like that, Chope, I bet you get known by lots of different names and get called lots of different things. Oh, yes. A lot of different names and a lot of different things. Brings back a lot of bad memories, especially from school, especially when we had supply teachers. And I'm just cringy because my name's A as well. So you're going to be one of the first in the register. Like, oh, my gosh. He's going to kill it. How bad is it going to be? How bad is it going to kill my name? And he does. And everyone starts laughing. And so, yes, I've had that for a very long time. It's kind of ironic, really, isn't it? That we're, today we're talking about inclusion. Mm. Yet your name really does set you apart. It does. So let's put the irony to one side. How have you dealt with that kind of separation through your name? And some of the conversations that have come around that. I guess for me, it's going through a journey as an individual. And in fact, I'll go back to what I just said around 
being a lot younger, especially as a teenager and having my name and teacher says it and it's soap, subpoena, some sort of like random randomness that comes out of teachers' names and you're feeling cringeworthy and like, oh, why did my parents just give me a completely different name and all of that? But then as I grew up and not that much, probably about 14, 15, and I kind of took a step back and I like, actually, my name, especially in Nigerian tradition, when you're giving a child a name like that, your names are a prophecy over that person. So my full name, for example, mm. means give thanks to God. So by nature, I'm actually a very grateful person. And a lot of situations, experiences that I go through, I have a very different perspective on them. And it's like, okay, it's going through this and it's hard, it's tough, but you know, I'm still alive. I still have my health and what can I do to reframe this? And all of that for me links back to what my parents told me from when I was born and when they made that declaration over myself. So me really leaning into that from being 14 to 15, like, you know what? Other people are going to say what they want to say and they're going to kill your name, but recognize the foundations of why you have that name and own it. And that gave me a different lens and different confidence because I spent a lot of years before that using different names. I had a lot of them. I had nicknames. Your nicknames. I had nicknames that I used and I had other names, which are not my name, that I claimed were my name just because I wanted to avoid just what I thought as embarrassment of what my name was. But then that confidence and me leaning into myself from a young age actually really shaped who I've become. Because as you get older and interested in like my name is when I put my name in job applications, for example, and I wasn't getting through and I changed it to, I don't know, Dave Smith, same skill, same experience, same everything, just a different email address and a different name. I was getting callbacks. And it's the different things like that. I'm like, okay, I know I'm going to have this repeatedly with my name, but because I had that confidence, I'm like, I'm not going to let that deter me. It just means I'm going to have to navigate a lot differently to other people. And that's fine. That's mm-hmm. just part of the process. It also means that you've learned to embrace the traditions of your family. And I think some of that's lost these days, isn't it? In terms of, you know, where we come from and why certain things are done in a certain way. Mm. And through your name. And I do get it. It's that how do you make yourself more appealing because your name sounds strange to somebody? Do you think that including, you know, the foundations of your name and explaining that in a CV or a cover letter could kind of just propel you forward in the pack to make you stand out? No. And In fact, I wouldn't even consider it because for me, if you are making the judgment just based on my name, then that's a problem more about you rather than me. That's not my issue or my burden to, to carry. That's for you to deal with. So me, in a sense, putting the definition of my name on something like a cover letter or CV is me trying to justify myself. But you've just made a passing judgment without actually getting to know the character of the person and just based on the person's name. I think this is where it's divisive because I don't see it as a judgment. I just see it as breaking down a barrier. So but why, why is it my remit to break down that barrier? I mean, there's a good example. I think it's Tchaikovsky. People use a lot of times as an example that people learn his name. He's known all around the world around classical music, but you learn his name. There's so many other difficult names that are hard to pronounce. But they've been learned because people took that time to do that. He didn't go around saying my name means this, so it's that. It was his his work spoke for him. Definitely wanted to know who he was. But his character never changed, and his name never changed. So if you want to be inclusive, you take the time to be like, how do you pronounce your name? For example, right at the start, you're like, you knew my first name. You're like, I'm gonna take an attempt at your second name. I might get it wrong, but I'm gonna <laughs> yeah. try. I'm like, cool. But it's you even going out, you know what? I know it's hard. I know it's difficult, but I'm still going to try and make an attempt at it. Or a lot of people ask me like, so how do you say your name? Like, what's the best way to say your name? That makes a difference as opposed to you just making an assumption and being like, oh, he's, he's got, uh, is it got an African name. Therefore he's, he's what exactly? Because the reason why I said that is if you look at a CV, those roles that I was applying for that I wasn't getting when I eventually stepped into them or managed to get myself into the door, I was great at what I did. 
So yeah. my work was still on point. My character was to the point. Nothing had changed whatsoever. And in fact, those organizations benefited. But that recruiter lost out because he chose, because he saw a name that he found difficult. And therefore he had a bias about that to not put me forward for those roles. So therefore I didn't lose out in theory. It was, it was hard for me. He did, because that was his bonus. He could look up. There's a real strength of character, I think, in having to overcome something. And I don't mean to kind of be judgmental at all. Mm -hmm. I always want to be editorial. Let's call it editorial. If we can break down barriers and explain things in such a way just to make people think about things differently, that I kind of get what you're saying is that those people have missed out because of belief systems that they've got. Mm. Right. And had they have just realized that they should be looking not at the name, but at what skill sets are coming to them, then you're likely to be raised up to the top of the pile. So what can we do to educate people to be more inclusive then? I think it comes down to you recognizing a bias that we all have. And I say all of us, because every single person has a bias. Whether we like it or not, whether we want to admit it or not, we all have something that's, that's still underlining. So for some person, it might be around the name. So if I find the name difficult, or I find myself disregarding someone just because of the name, it's, why is that? Why am I doing that? And it's you stopping and asking yourself whatever situation or circumstance that you find yourself, why am I taking that particular action? What assumptions am I making, am I using? as a barometer to make that decision. Mm -hmm. If we asked ourselves more and more those kind of questions, it will make such a massive difference in society because it flows in, whether you're talking about gender, where men can be like, oh, a woman can't do that job. Or you're talking about intersectionalities or other different areas like that. It's all the same thing where it's linked into the biases, the way that Sometimes it's culture. Sometimes it's just been the way that you are raised. I mean, I, I have it a lot of times where there are some senior leaders that still believe that women sh cannot run organizations. Oh, it's that pink and blue jobs, isn't it? So I was only having this conversation <laughs> yeah, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my best friend, she says, I, you know, I'm so jealous your husband, he does all these jobs in a potters and he makes log stores and he builds stuff. And I said, yeah, your husband, he interferes in women's work. You know, he likes to cook and things like that. And we were laughing and giggling about it because there really shouldn't be a pink or blue role. Mm. If you want to, to take on a challenge and learn a skill, nothing should hold you back. Okay, there's going to be some things that will hold some people back. You know, I'm not going to be a heavyweight boxer, for example, because I'm not fat enough. There are other biases that come in, isn't there, about height and weight and yep. colour and shape and your accent, how you speak. Yeah. In fact, that's a great example of last year in particular, I worked with a group of senior leaders and they are what I'll call like high-flying senior execs. But every single one of them all had babies in a pandemic. So this is the first time they were all at home with their kids. And the interesting was, I started working with them. So I don't know how, what's going on, what was in the water at that point in time in the organization. But there was 12 of them and they all had kids roughly around a month, <laughs> a month of each other. <laughs> They'd all been busy. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what was going on at work at that point nine months ago, but that's what happened. <laughs> so this is about five months in. It was very interesting. They had all gone from doing, on average, because the industry they worked in, they were consultants, they probably did about 70 to 80 hour weeks as standard. They were now saying, we don't want to go back to doing that. In fact, they were advocates and pushing their HR, like, we don't want to go back to work. We actually want to be at home, spending time present. with kids, as with our parents. babies and all of that. And that's something that you would, I was speaking to HR guy afterwards, he's like, I have never heard them talk or behave because they are seen as that's just what they did they just worked mm -hmm. and they said to be fair if they were not at home in the pandemic they will never have changed their ways of looking at things because they view certain things as oh our partners are home looking after the kids and we're providing financially but being at home in that environment forced them to have a completely different 
mindset. And it's there to be like, actually, I'm missing out on something or certain things. And a lot of it was down to cultural norms and stereotypes that when we talked about it, they had grown up with. But being in that environment in lockdown for that period of time got them thinking that I've only done this because this is what I'm used to. I've seen my parents do. Is it the right thing to do? Me being around, I'm missing out on my daughter. I'm actually getting to know my wife again <laughs> because we've been yeah. married for 20 or 30 years. I don't really know because I'm hardly ever around. I'm either traveling around the world. So different things like that start to change. And we still having those conversations, which change the way that you look at things and you look at situations, that perspective shift, either it's around the pink and blue or around cooking or yeah. around or the match, moms. be a builder, all of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was asking my LinkedIn family, do you feel that being a woman in a career and a mother has held you back? Because there are stereotypes around, you know, the women picking up the kids from school, having to provide dinner at a certain time after the male has come home from killing whatever it is and coming back. It's still happening, isn't it? I don't know what the answers are. I just hope that we're moving towards it being a choice. When you look at, I guess, my traditional perspective with how you see things and how you approach things, What's created that shift for you in the how you've done things for yourself? Oh, I kind of told myself that I would have my time. Mm. And that's now. Let me tell you, it's now. That my children would get to a certain point in their of, of age and independence, and I would slowly start to turn that tap on. Mm. And I would go for the things that I knew through maturity as well, because... I do believe that I could have had a very successful corporate career, but would have I, I have enjoyed doing that? I don't know. Hindsight's a, a really tricky, tricky, tricky character. Mm. So I've done what I've enjoyed doing as well as having my family, knowing that I would be learning everything that I would need to the time when I'd be going, me. I love that because it's, it's very intentional. Yeah. And you have to really think about it and think about the different stages as well with the children and now it's my time and everything else like that. Question around, around how to begin to change things. It's that intention that flows through. It's how do we decide of how we're going to live our lives and what approaches we're going to take. And you making that decision is something that not a lot of people do. You just go with the flow. And you've been actually, I'm going to intentionally, like, hey, Kids are going to do this up to the point, and then now it's my turn to do this. With inclusion, exactly the same. People can be intentional about making that decision about how they're going to approach people and approach situations, or they choose not to and just go with the flow. It's all a choice. And in some respects, it's about creating the opportunity for you to be going in the flow that you want rather than just following the current, you know? Yep. It's like the road of, that's a straight road ahead and it's tarmac or it's the bush <laughs> where you've got to hack through the undergrowth and you find paradise. Mm. I think that's a similar kind of analogy. What about you, Chopin? Along the lines of intentionality, all the choices and decisions I've made have been geared around the family. And naturally speaking, it's what I want to do, how I don't want to achieve it. But what's the goals that we're trying to achieve either as husband and wife, as a father to my two kids and as an individual, like what difference, the reason why I left my, my corporate role all those years ago was I wanted to make a difference using the skill set that I, I had. And I was sick and tired of just seeing things not change. What do you do now that impacts? What's the legacy that you are building? Ah. Oh. The legacy I am building is, I'm going to call it the twofold legacy. There's one at the personal level, which is to be authentic in everything I do and therefore be a good role model to my children. Not because it's, oh, daddy's done this and therefore I still what daddy's done, but more when daddy says he's going to step outside of his comfort zone, he actually does that. When he says he's going to do certain things, he models that. So when it comes to them stepping outside their comfort zone or them taking a chance on certain things, they can see that 
I'm not just talking about it. I'm also living it. And so is their mother. And that for me, my legacy, everything I do always starts at home. So grow through doing them. that. Yeah I'm, yeah. I'm doing that for myself as an individual, because I feel like even when we talk a lot about, which is what I do talk a lot about leadership, but coach leaders, leadership for me starts with self. So I know how to lead myself and lead myself well. And then it now becomes, okay, who's then immediate to you? Or for me, that's my wife and my children. So how am I leading them and, and vice versa? There's a two-way relationship with both of them, but how am I leading them? How are they leading me? And then it now flows into the next level, which is then around organizations. We spend, people spend so much time at work mm. and we can create environments where people can go into where they can grow, they can be developed, they can be cared for. And then people are thinking, oh, that's all fluffy stuff. Actually, no, all those different things I'm talking about lead to innovation, growth, productivity, high pressure. Yeah. And that's the second level of my, of what I see my legacy as. It's on that systematic change approach, which involves working one-on-one -on -one with a lot of leaders, either in corporates or startups, but then doing a lot of work in cultures around how they are creating and fostering their environment for people to grow and shine. Because I want my kids to be able to grow up. And if they want to go into corporate environments and it'd be environments where they will have those different things, yeah. not environments that I grew up in where I didn't have those different things. And I had to intentionally create them for those who I was leading or navigate a lot of bullying, racism, all that kind of stuff, which I don't want my children to go through either. So that's why my legacy for me is that personal piece. And then it now flows into the systematic organizational piece as well. Mm, beautiful. I mean, you're kind of unpicking a lot of what should be taught in school. Mm. As I see it, we seem to have a nurturing primary system that's very inclusive and it's about the taking part, not the winning, which not everybody agrees with. And in some instances, you need a bit of competitiveness. Right? You do. So there's got to be a bit of balance. <laughs> But there's going to be a bit of balance. And then you go to high school, we're going to treat you like an adult, but we're going to tell you what to do and you'd better do it. Mm. So I think a, a lot of our younger generation come out of school now, not really sure how to be when it comes to the workplace. So when it comes to inclusion and going for an environment of work where they're going to enjoy it, one, they're going to gravitate to what they know because it feels safe or comfortable yeah, will they be that aspiring to go and want to be more? I just ask lots of questions. I don't have all the answers. But that's also what makes a difference is you don't need to have the answers. It's you just need to be willing to ask the right questions. I say it like as a coach, I don't have the answers. I'm coaching people in roles that I've never worked in or never operated in. But that's what my remit is. My remit is I can ask you great questions that get you to help you to think through the situation that you're going through. And doesn't always mean it's the right answers either. Because there are times when we make decisions mm. where it might not be the right answer, but previously you were struggling to make a decision. So now you've made a decision. Action, yeah. We need to make take some action to some action. push on. Yeah. And you learn from it. And you learn from the mistakes that you've made, which again is something that a lot of people struggle because I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to be that person. Actually, you learn more in your failures than in your success every single time. Failings, not failure. Well, <laughs> it all depends. <laughs> because I agree with what you said, but I see it as if you say I'm a failure, then it's don't, it's don't go with failure. No, it's not don't, good. It's not good. But if you say I failed at something, I failed at a task, or I've not accomplished that task, you still failed at it. But I'm learning. Yeah. So it's that approach, and that's that difference between, I guess, the growth and the fixed mindset. One says I'm a failure. That's the end of the world. I'm rubbish. I'm I'm this and that and all that. And you're very very negative about yourself. Other one says, okay, that hasn't worked out, and I've and I failed at that. Yeah. yeah. What did I learn from that experience? What did I gain from that? Even if it means that what you learned moves you one step further, that's still a lot more than you had previously. Yeah, I mean, we have a long life. I mean, I would hope for everybody that we have a long life. So we don't need to learn all the lessons in the first 20 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> the society will tell you you need to know what, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, I'm so glad I'm separated from society. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I jest, of course, but it is about, you know, starting from yourself. And I'm a great believer in this, that if I can create a good reflection, yeah, then I'm automatically creating the right environment for growth. So that's kind of what I see. And in that environment of growth, what would be the intention behind doing that for you? Oh, God. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm fairly intentional in, it, in all things. Often it's to just prove to my husband that I am always right. <laughs> <laughs> After that, look, I just want to be a good human being. And I think that's all everybody wants at the end of the day. And when it comes to the people that you're surrounded by, if you're surrounded by people who have got that similar outlook for life, then you're going to live a long, warm, rich life. And I'm not talking money. I'm talking filled up in your soul. Well, sometimes it needs to. (laughs) (laughs) Back to the topic of inclusion. Yes. Come and join my gang. You'll feel warm and fuzzy inside. <laughs> so, Shope, I ask everybody who comes on to the show to share a conversation that counted for them. So, the show's yours for now. To tell us all about it. The one that stands out to me the most happened probably 18 years ago or so when I was at university and I was with my girlfriend at that time and she approached me and she told me I wasn't very serious. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm a very, I'm a very serious guy. And she's like, no, like you're not, you're not serious about being in a committed relationship and you still want to have your fun and do what you're doing with your boys, which is fine. Your university. Oh you know, you're, dear, girls are 18, you know, they yeah. like they're 80 already, <laughs> don't they? You know? you're, you're a young guy and all of that. <laughs> and so she's like, I just think that we should break up and we should be friends. Here's the interesting thing about that. She was the first person I would say that has probably called me out like that. And that resonated with me. Because 18 years later, she's my wife. (laughs) (laughs) But that conversation that we had always has always struck out to me because I was always very, um, I'm a chill, relaxed, laid back kind of person. But I always said that I will know when I meet someone that challenges me in a way that no one else does. Mm -hmm. And her having, I guess I'm going to call it a level of respect for herself that says that, you know what? Yeah, we're doing all right. And I wasn't cheating her or nothing like that, but I can tell that you're not hundred percent in this and therefore we can still be friends. I like to be friends with you, but I'm just going to pull away because it's not right for me. For me, really, really there's something that sounds like, Hmm. And it made me step up from what I call from a boy to a man in the way I said to look at things and look at situations. And together we've been able to achieved so much because she has taught me so much and she is like she like said she's my best friend like we've gone through a lot it hasn't always been easy being together for a very long time a very young age as you can imagine especially at university it was some <laughs> it was not some hell <laughs> it was not easy at all was it the idea of you losing that bond that you hadn't been able to express made you sort of go, no, hang on. I am really serious about this. I hadn't realized that I needed to show you just yet. No, I think it was the willingness to put yourself first and recognize what you needed. You were not getting for me stood out. That was one. Okay. The second, yeah. the second thing was then around me then taking some time back, well, just because she made a statement, me actually, I'd like to do a lot of introspection, taking the time and be like, actually, one, what am I doing? What am I trying to do? What do I have in my hands? And I'm like, yeah, we're still young, but I've always been a, so the way I think is very differently. I'm like, actually, I have a great woman here in front of me who I can see myself building with. I can see myself actually creating life with. Am I willing to risk 
that and just ignore this relationship and go and wild out and do that and have my fun. And is my fun, the fun that's apparently out there in the grass is greener, is it really, really worth it? Or do I really want to take the time to actually see if what I have in front of me with this woman is worth the journey because she ticks all the other boxes that I already knew in my head that when I meet the person, there was that conversation I was having with myself that actually made that difference. I'm like, actually, let me step up. I call myself, oh, you're 18, 19, I'm a man. And it's like, what does that actually <laughs> mean? Really, what, does that really, yeah, what, does that, what does that really mean? So it was those kind of conversations that got me thinking, because I didn't respond back to it straight away. I kind of went back, thought about it, went back to it again. And we said, okay, let's, let's try this and let's see. Because bear in mind, she had her own flaws and faults and all of that. But it was that conversation that really sparked a difference in how I was approaching things and her. And like I said, a number of years at university together, we went through so much, a lot of growth for me, for her. All of that was just foundational because 16 years later, we're married, got two beautiful kids and it was great to be with her. Do you know what I love about this story is that you gave yourself the space to get the crystal ball out. We've stopped imagining our future. People say about vision boards and, you know, if you can see yourself with somebody, then you're likely to be with them because you've created that emotional attachment. Mm -hmm. So our imagination is so strong that you could look ahead and go, no, I want that. So many people would just be quite shallow and just look at the surface of things and go, well, it didn't work out then, you know, <laughs> wouldn't they? And, you know, well, I'll just scratch that up to, you know, move on. How beautiful. Mm, you've got me all nostalgic now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shopee, thank you so much for coming on the show. I think it's been an absolute blast talking to you. I always encourage the listeners to carry the conversation on. So where's the best place for them to find you? The best place would probably be LinkedIn. If you type in my name, it should be too hard to find. So S-O-P-E-A-G-B-E-L-U-S-I will be on there. So either LinkedIn or Instagram is the same or my website, www.mindsetshift.co.uk. Perfect. Well, make sure it's all in the show notes. And uh, thank you. Say hi to your wife. I like her already. <laughs> I will. And thank you very much for having me, Wendy. I absolutely enjoyed this. Do you agree with me? You like his wife already? Yeah. What a lovely family they must make. Next week, we're going to be talking about menopause with Bev Thorogood. And now this is one that's not just for the ladies because Bev offers some really great advice for those chaps out there that don't have a clue. I'm going to make my chap have a listen too. In the meantime, don't forget to hit that review button. Follow us in the show notes. If you ever have somebody that you want to share the episode with, but they're not into listening to podcasts, there's a transcript on the website so they can read all about the conversation on screen. Until next time, take care. Men might not experience it personally, but they're certainly impacted by it.